This is an August 27, 1988 interview for Historic Madison by Hallie Lou Blum. We're talking jointly with Myron Stevens, Alice Malosh, also known as Patty, and Adeline Stephan. All three of these individuals were born and raised in Madison and have lived here all their lives. And we'll start the interview with Myron. This is an August 27, 1988 interview by Hallie Lou Blum for Historic Madison Incorporated. It will be a joint interview with Myron Stevens, Alice Malash, known as Patty, and Adeline Stephan. All three of these individuals were born and raised in Madison and have spent their entire lives here. And now we will start the interview with Myron Stevens. Take the South Madison streetcar and uh, walk a little bit when you got over there. And of course, that was all right. And there were horse races and a whole lot of things where you could buy popcorn and uh, whatever you wanted. And a lot of sideshow things. That's where the Coliseum is now. Yes, mm -hmm. and there were there was always a nice collection of animals too, farm animals. Yes, and I, I always liked those, and I liked to walk over to the uh, university in the spring. It was customary for some of the kids to get together and walk over to the university barns and see the animals. Oh, that was good. Pigs and cows and sheep and uh, <laughs> chickens, and of course you would always stop in the dairy department and get a cup of free buttermilk, a glass of free buttermilk. After a while, they started charging for it. And then we didn't go quite so often. <laughs> Daddy, have you lived in Madison all your life? Yes, except for uh, the uh, time that uh, um, my mother and I were out on the West Coast for about a year and a half. And then summers when Mel and I were up at Trout Lake and some winters when we were in uh, uh, Tucson. Mm. So. Uh, I'm certainly an old Madison resident. And your career was always at the university? Yes. That's remarkable. So I'm very much university oriented. Sure. Mm -hmm. After you were a statistician, what was your next post? Running the Student Employment Bureau. Good work. Mm -hmm. I know you're mm -hmm. famous for that. <laughs> <laughs> I started in with nothing. Um, I had a desk, no telephone. So I thought I'd better go over to the library and see if I can find out something. There wasn't anything written or at least published about mm -hmm. student employment. So I went back over to the desk and started writing to uh, other schools. I remember Indiana, Minnesota, and Illinois, and Michigan, and asking, Iowa, I guess, asking if I could have copies of their blanks and would they tell me how they ran there. So I used those for bases to get started here. Where was here. your office? Back at Main Hall? It was, uh, no, it was in the administration building. And where was it The old porterhouse at the corner of, of uh, State and, and Park. Park. And I had a little cubby hole, <laughs> which was... Uh, Six feet by ten or something. Yes, <laughs> just, yeah, just about that. And there was room for a desk in there. And when I got a helper a little later, she sat on one side of the desk, and if any students came in, I could get in one or two at a time. And uh, there was a, a back room, too, that... Uh, oh but that was very often used by the accountants and other people that had to overflow. What kind of employment would you get for students? Well, local lo people? Yeah, lo local. Uh, there wasn't a great call from restaurants and things except in summer and uh, holiday times for students to work for meals because that was the most popular type of uh, employment, especially for boys. Mm -hmm. They wanted to work for the meals because that was the most expensive item they had here on the mm -hmm. campus. And um, then we would ha have homes for girls, a few for boys, where they'd work for room and board. And that was mainly, um, oh, perhaps washing the evening dishes and staying with the children when the parents were out. Mm -hmm. And uh, those places varied considerably in their desirability. And uh, the same thing for boys, staying with children and doing some household chores. And, um, then part-time jobs in stores, and uh, typists, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, did any of 
the university departments use students? Oh yes, they used a, a number because they would have a lecture jobs to do, mm -hmm. and uh, also the um, teaching staff, the professorial staff, would use students for uh, extra things where they had some extra typing. Mm -hmm. to be done. But if if a student had any trained skill, uh, he could usually get some kind of job. Maybe not immediately, but something was available for trained students. Maybe. Uh, they had something to offer. A graduation was in those days in the old gym, was it, on Langley Street? Or had the stock pavilion? Stock, uh, stock pavilion when I graduated. Mm. I remember that well because Van Heis was the president and uh, Philip was the governor and Art Nielsen, who was um, T. Art Nielsen, uh, was the uh, class orator, at least he was giving me. Oh, he was in your class. Yes, and so he was getting the address. And so uh, uh, Philip and Van Heist sat up on the platform, of course, and, and Nielsen. And Nielsen gave a very good address. Everybody looked at very carefully. And Mr. Van Heist got up and uh, was delivering his oration, and Mr. Philip fell asleep. <laughs> 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 I don't know whether that ought to be in there now. Oh, good. <laughs> <laughs> but um, uh, Mr. Van Heys, uh, what he had to say was worth listening to, but uh, he was not what you would call a compelling orator. Mm -hmm. And uh, he didn't talk very long. I was sitting right up near the front, too, so I had a good look. <laughs> well, then did the governor, was he awakened to give his speech? Oh, yes. He, uh, he, uh, <laughs> and he didn't talk very long, but we all listened to what he had to say. <laughs> and, uh, of course, no one got his own diploma. Oh. Uh, you were handed a diploma, and then you uh, went around uh, scrambling around uh, to figure out who's. After <laughs> which you, you showed up at. Uh, but you did walk across one. and receive a. Oh yes, you walked across and received a diploma, and uh, that was very exciting. And then uh, after the bachelor's, of course, then all the um, and masters and uh, doctors and special people came up, and you began to think that what you got wasn't so much after That's all. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> Did you go to football games then, Patty? Some, yes. Remember any of the outstanding football players' names? Mm -hmm. Those mm -hmm. were the days before Raleigh Williams. Yes. Uh, Raleigh Barnum. Raleigh Barnum. Mm -hmm. Well, he yes, played they, later, they were, didn't he? Yes, and of course they were basketball too. Yeah. I don't remember so much. Uh, of course the war kind of cut down on things. And I didn't have a lot of money to go around to things, so I didn't do much. They probably but didn't cost as much then as they do no, now. No, it didn't cost as much, but once in a while I could go to a five-cent movie. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> and you spent five cents on the streetcar. Yes. yes. <laughs> well, after you left State Street, where did you move? Where did you live then? You didn't live there all the time. No, well, um, um, uh, we had sold the house. That was in January 1923. So for a few months, Mother and I lived in a furnished apartment over on West Gilman Street. Mm -hmm. And uh, then in June, we left for the West Coast, and we lived out there for a year and a half. And when we came back, we went to the Saloon Hotel and lived there until we moved to Kennedy Manor. And I lived there until I was married. Now, you've heard of the Kickover Wall. <laughs> what was that? Oh, dear, didn't I bring the pictures down there? I want to bring you some fresh pictures. Maybe they're in your case? No, I didn't bring them. The Kickoffer Wall was, that was on Langdon Street. Oh, of course. That was on Langdon Street. Back of where you were, well, you were on the front end of that block. Yes, we were on State Street, and the Kickoffer okay. of Owen, the Owen house, was uh, Gladys Owen married Kickoffer, and that's why it was called Kikofer Place. Oh. And, uh, and Mr. Owen was the father-in-law of William H. Kikofer, is he? Right. Oh, okay. And he was a French teacher. Oh. And uh, incidentally, he was very tall, about like Kirk Stone, and uh, Mrs. Owen was about like Vera Stone, a little bit of things. So, so we used to have a lot of fun about them, you know, because when they'd walk along, it was just a thing. And uh, uh, the stone wall ran from Francis Street around to the end of our place on State Street. Why didn't I bring that picture? I'm going to show it to you later. And um, there was a pillar there at the end of the stone wall, at the end of our property. And um, somebody knocked that pillar down. Mm -hmm. And uh, 
um, Mr. Sipper found a picture and uh, yeah. gave me a copy of the, of the picture. So I have a, a picture of that pillar. And the, uh, the sidewalk used to be quite a little above the street, maybe not as much as this table, but you step down oh. with the steps to get to the street. And later, uh, when that was paved, they raised it up and uh, raised the, uh, lowered the sidewalk, and they put a wide, quite a deep wall, oh. uh, too deep to sit on along the front there. And then there were stores all the way down the street. And um, um, Mother sold the property, it was, I think, January 23. And the Mr. Bertrand, uh, a banker in the forest, no, on Prairie, bought the place and immediately started tearing down all the trees in the front yard and built these stores that were back there. And uh, you remember her Antoine, who was on State Street? Uh, that was uh, mm -hmm. a store in, in our front yard. Yeah. Yeah. And the house is still standing uh, where I was born. And, and that house was built in 1893, my father built it. And uh, the house is still standing. It's been converted to a rooming house. And uh, it, it looks quite you, different. You spoke of the sidewalk. In those days, were the sidewalks made out of wood? Yes. I remember when I grew up in Arlington Place, our sidewalks were wood. Sure. And, and they were, they were uh, they had a little space in between so that they could drain a little bit. Yeah. You know? Yes. And they didn't have a State Street wasn't in concrete then, was it? No, no. That was um, uh, when when they uh, uh, when they ra uh, lo lowered the uh, sidewalk, uh, then they had a concrete street in mm -hmm. there. But that used to be a nice muddy street. But you say the the streetcar was a single track. Later years, didn't they have double track on State Street? Well, we seems to me they did, but I, I'm not no, sure. They, I I think that was after we we left there. I'm, I'm not sure how they had a double track. They might have. Of course, State Street was never very wide. That's right. On, on the other hand, I think too. That might be I, wrong. I, th I think they had the, they still use that switch place up there at the corner of the Park and the State. By the old administration building. And Lou Porter used to live there, the state architect building. Then it came the administration building. Would you like to tell us something about your career? <laughs> your university <laughs> okay. I'm Myron Stevens, and I was born on August 8, 1902. And we, I originally lived on Arlington Place in a house that I think our family house was about the second house built on University Heights. The first house was the Buell House right up on the top, then called Buell's Folly. Uh -huh. And at those days, uh, th I'm too early to remember this, uh, too young to remember this but then, but I think that Breeze Terrace is about as far west as the city went, so that people building in University Heights were really on the outskirts of the city. I think our house was built in 1901, I remember my mother once telling me that she lived in a tent just west of that house, and when an electrical storm would come in summer, it scared her, so she'd go up to the Buell house, <laughs> so she'd be undercover. They were living there while the house was being built? They, were li they lived there while the house was being built. And she and my father both graduated in 1893, as I remember it. My father went to law school and then became associated with Burr Jones who was a famous lawyer. And uh, Patty, you spoke about uh, Bob La Follette. In about 1901 or oh, in about 19, I don't remember when it was, but Bob La Follette appointed my father as the first circuit judge. Uh -huh. So he served as a circuit judge for many, many years. I went to Randall School on Spooner Street, and Randall School in those days was just a four-room building. You remember that, Patty, probably. Way out. Uh, that's right. And then I went to University High School, Fool's Retreat often called, which is now no longer, and, and it's ceased to be a school after a while, and I graduated from the university in 1923, in law 1926, and became associated with what used to be known as Bagley, Spohn, and Ross, and I've been with that law firm ever since. And many of the things that Patty has talked about are, are refreshing to me, 
And there isn't very much that I can add as far as early history is concerned, because as I think about it, I've asked Patty questions, and Patty yeah. has answered most of that. Did you ever go to a boys' camp? Were there any camps around? I don't remember. I was a member of Troop 13 of Boy Scout, oh, all right. and Mr. McCaffrey, Fa Agatha Church's father, used to be our scoutmaster. Oh. And once or twice we had a camp down on Lake Kiganza. He also had a boat on Lake Michigan. I remember one time we had a boat trip on Lake Michigan as in our Boy Scout troop. We used to vacation in Door County. And I'm, uh, How the, did you get there? Well, we would get there. We'd take the afternoon train from here to Milwaukee. Then we'd get on the Goodrich boat in Milwaukee, sleep there. The boat would stop at uh, Sheboygan, Manitowoc, Kiwani, Algoma, go through the ship canal into Sturgeon Bay. And we usually get off at Sturgeon Bay and stay there, but for many years we did that. The Goodrich boats in those days were the were the means of getting to Door County. You remember those, Patty, don't you? Or not? Oh, uh, yes, I... You remember of them anyway. Yeah. Right. But those have long since gone out of... And I remember they used to have a whaleback. Mm. Remember they used to run between Milwaukee and Chicago? And you remember way back when, when the Eastland capsized oh, yeah. in Milwaukee? And I remember that they, that to show the safety of the whaleback, they took it out one time and loaded all one side of it with a lot of sandbags, oh. which would be the equivalent of people yeah. rushing over there and to show that it wouldn't tip over. I remember that very distinctly. And it, and it worked? And it, it, worked, it didn't tip over, yes. Oh, good. <laughs> but we used to take the streetcar, ride our bicycles, have picnics out in the Shorewood, Walk out to Picnic Point. Patty, you were on Picnic Point many times. Oh, yes. That was a, um, a nice hike. A good mile or so. Do you remember the, the bag rushes on mower camping? <laughs> yes, I remember the bag rush. I was in one in 1919, I guess. And then they, I think they abolished them after that. Well, my brother was in one in the 20s. But in those days, the sophomores would line up freshmen and take them out in the country, you remember? Oh, <laughs> and, and leave them so they oh, couldn't dear, and so, walk back. so they couldn't get back in time for the bag rush. Oh, I see. And then usually the sophomores would flood the freshman side with uh, with water. So it was just a sea of mud. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. That's what I remember. <laughs> and then I remember bonfires on the lower campus. They used to that's right. That? They used to have a homecoming bonfire on the oh. lower campus. You remember those, Patty? Oh yes, and, and Box, you know, or chairs, I remember. Oh, they'd, they'd scrounge around and yeah. get every piece of wood that they could. But I think they finally figured those are too dangerous yeah. and, and had to discontinue them. Mm -hmm. But, Patty, you don't remember the, the green, little green caps. Oh, mercy, yes. Oh, yes. and the little red button on the yeah. You tell about those, and then, then the sophomore would come to say a freshman, button up or button. Yes. And the freshman press, press would have to put they, their hand they, on the cap. They had to finger, put their hand up on the little cap. And I don't know how long those caps lasted, but uh, uh, I, I think they went out uh, maybe after. Well, I had one when I came war. in 1919. Mm -hmm. I, think I, I don't think it was many years mm -hmm. after that no. that they did yeah. it. No, I think by 1925 probably they were all, all gone. Were those issued to the students, or did they oh, buy, you them? buy them? Well, you, you, had buy them. To, you had to buy them. And if you didn't have one, well, that was just too bad. Ooh. You'd get thrown in the lake if you didn't have one. <laughs> oh, dear. <laughs> <laughs> and were there s a stores, I can remember a co-op store, where students bought books, and they also bought clothing? Mm -hmm. Well, that was uh, that was not in its present location. No. That was up uh, on State Street, um, Right under Miss Richmond's Academy, wasn't it? Somehow. Where Wehrman's now is. Yes. Uh, oh. You spark up Miss Where Wehrman's used to be. I don't know whether they're still on uh, State Street or not. Wehrman's. I don't know. but uh, there. And then we used to have a number. It was a co-op. We all had a number. And then oh. we'd buy books. We'd uh -huh. give our number. And at the end of the year, we could go back and get a rebate. Maybe 5% uh -huh. or something yeah. of that sort. They discontinued that some time ago. I'll bet. I remember my number was 11888. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> Mine was 17650. I can remember that. <laughs>
Did you always have a telephone when you were uh, your early years in Madison? Oh, yes, and it was the standard, not the bell. Oh. And it was one of these tall ones, and you, and you, you had crank? to crank ah. it to, to get central. And you, you had no prefix, you just had a number. There was no of a prefix with it. And later, you had Badger or Fairchild. Child, yes, I remember. We had Fairchild. Of course, child. we don't have that. We have um, uh, numbers now, longer numbers. Yeah. And then uh, the bell line came in, finally. And then that had the little box like this. And the standard, well, sometimes you had both standard and bell. There, there were two of them for a time, weren't there? Yeah, standard mm -hmm. and bell. Yeah, that's right. And then standard disappeared, and it was called bell, and I guess it's been bell ever since. And the early phones were on the wall, is that, is that right? Yeah. That's the way I remember. Mm -hmm. And then gradually, you, they had a desk model. Yes. In the early days, Patty, you used to have, you had Christmas trees as now. <coughs> you had Christmas trees. Oh, sure. But you didn't have electric light. No, you had oh. candles, and uh, I, I suppose there were more fires in those days. I remember we had some candles. My father was always very particular about that. And uh, uh, so they were only yeah. lighted when an adult was there. Oh, yeah. oh yes. I can't ever remember lighting the tree, mm -hmm. and um, I was a little bit in awe about that. Right. In the early days, the fire trucks were drawn by horses. Remember that? Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. And they used to have one across the, the building, right across from the arch on uh, Randall Avenue. Yes. Oh. Over by in the place where that they uh, have old a, building is now. They have a fire station. The corner yeah. of Dayton and Randall. Uh-huh. Well, That's right. It's an apartment building. Yeah. And then there used yes. to be one right on the on the first block on State Street off the Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. And the main one was up on... Uh, Webster, Webster Street, Street. Oh. But between um, the back of where the first Wisconsin bank is. Yes, now. back of there. And those big trucks were drawn by three horses, <gasps> and that was oh, very impressive. Been exciting. Yeah, three right. horses. And I can remember in those old in those days, they used to exercise the horses every day, and the ones on Randall Avenue would drive would go up uh, Regent Street. Uh, Breeze Terrace back on University oh, Avenue. Oh, yeah, that was enough. <laughs> Every day they'd go out and run. Mm -hmm. I remember when Houseman's Brewery caught fire. Oh, my. They said that um, never had the department made such a prompt run to put out a fire. And uh, that was quite a... Do you remember the Capitol burning? Oh, uh, yes. And um, my father had something to do with that because um, he was a professor... Keep it close, yeah. He was a professor of mechanical engineering and one of his uh, jobs was to oversee the pump house, which is now where the uh, hydraulic lab is, you know, mm -hmm. on, on the oh, street. Yeah. And the pump house pumped water for utility purposes for the capital. Uh -huh. And when the capital burned, apparently the water had been shut off between the uh, university pump uh, station, which pumped Mendota water yes. to the capital. And my father was wakened about four o'clock in the morning to, to, what was it, to, uh, to go down and turn the water on. My goodness. Well, do you remember the fire? Did you see it? That was well, of course, that lasted old. That lasted quite a while. And I'm sure I got down there during the day, day to yeah. get as close as you could, and about all you could see was a lot of smoke. And it was in the winter time too, when you didn't stand around. No, it was no yeah. day to be idle. Yeah. <laughs> One I remember was... Uh, 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 the fire, and that was in February of one year when it was very cold. We'd had a snowstorm, and that was the old university club. Oh, and it was, was the that? Parkinson House, and Mr. Parkinson was vice president of the university at that time, and the house caught fire. And uh, mm -hmm. uh, they had two girls rooming up on the third floor, and uh, it was just before junior prom, and uh, they lost their dresses. Oh, dear. Mm. But not their lives. No, not their lives. Where was that house located? Uh, uh, where the university club is no. now. Yes. But it was the Parkinson house at that time. Yeah. And then it was, uh, they never did the uh, uh, remodel it to speak mm. up. It, it became the university club. The prom in those days used to be held in the gym, didn't it? In the gym. Mm -hmm. And then later, for a few years, they held it in the Capitol. In the Capitol, yes. yes. I don't remember that. Mm -hmm. Well, it was just there yeah. for a while. And then, uh, and then they used to have a military ball every year in those days. In the gym. In the gym. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They used to have a glee club, men's glee club, which they don't have anymore. Oh, well, and I guess the w the women's had a glee club. Women had a glee club too, or 
Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Well, that's yeah. right. Yes, that's taken the place. Yeah. And very successfully. Mm hmm I think. Do you remember when they first opened the Memorial Union? I remember that. Well, they were, they, I think they were building, no, they... Well, they built. They're bad. Well, in the late... I graduated in 1926. Mm-hmm. And I can remember that when the union was being built, they had a labor, there was a strike. Mm -hmm. Oh. Well, and I Mr. Spoon in our office represented the union. And so this could have been 1927, 28. I was thinking about 1928 yes. was I when the right. union so. was uh, built. Mm -hmm. And the, the theater was was added later. Yes. Uh, later yeah, I remember yeah. that. Mm -hmm. And our student employment bureau at first was in the uh, old administration building and then in the house next door. And then we moved over to the president's old house. And the the union was... was uh, Right on that spot. The union was uh, built at that time, except the West End, where the uh, theater is. Oh. And Did uh, the union at one time occupy the president's house? No. Some, no, some of the offices did. Okay. Sa Sally Owen and her uh, had an office in there, and the University YWCA oh. had an office in there. Yeah, I remember that. And uh, our employment office was on the first floor. Mm -hmm. Then they moved it over to the Union and when they tore down and then the in the old days, the w <coughs> excuse me, the YMCA was right next to the old gym. Yes. Mm -hmm. Between the Union and the gym. Mm -hmm. And they tore that down, of course. Mm -hmm. I see. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That, that, was, uh, that was quite a place. The museum was that was uh, quite a place to, to visit. And the historical library on the fourth floor, they had a, a museum that was a collection of a whole lot of things. And it was of interest to young children. And I remember especially um, the results of a cyclone, I think at New Richmond, Wisconsin. There was a, a tree there in which a, a, a slat of a bedstead had blown right through the tree. <laughs> and that was always fascinating to watch. I remember seeing that. Mm -hmm. That was on the top floor of what on is the now the historical society building. Yes, it was called the State Historic Society at that time. Mm -hmm. they and was that library. built when you were in uh, university? It was, wasn't it? Oh, yeah. I can remember when that was being built oh. because uh, the, the uh, stones were all lying out on the uh, lower, campus. lower campus, and it was fun to play hide and seek there because you could hide behind these big stones, you know, sure. and run around, and it wasn't too far from home. And um, those big flat stones, which... Uh, uh, formed the stone wall around the building, had some uh, funny figurations in it. We thought they were snakes, oh, yeah. and that the snakes had been in there when the stones had hardened by nature, and uh, so those were snakes. So we used to jump on those as children and pretend we were jumping over snakes, you know. <laughs> now, did, yeah. when they built that building, did they arrange with the university to use that as the library? Oh, I think that must have been planned because that certainly was been. the university yeah. library. That and that was all the library there was, That's except right. for, uh, I think it had been housed to uh, some extent in other p buildings. Engineering had a little bit, and Ag had oh. quite a library, mm -hmm. and uh, music hall I think too was. But that was the library even after I graduated in 1923. Well, it was library all through the 30s. It right? was the library until they built the one on the, the present one at the corner there of. Uh, mm -hmm. Of State and Lake. Patty, your earliest recollection of the campus, Bascom Hall, North House, and South Hall were there. Was the law school there early? Oh, yes. That's the law yes, and the the engineering law building across and the, the engineering campus. Was there. And the first science hall. Science hall mm -hmm. was there. The old gym was there. Yes, and Laser Hall, I think that was built somewhere in my mm -hmm. early, and Barnard Hall, and Chadron, of course, that was there. Oh, yeah, the old Chad was there for a long yes, time. Yes, that was there mm -hmm. for a long time. And a, a few of the ag buildings, um, or the barns, and ag hall, yeah. I think, they were there. And the cow barns were there. And the, yes, the cow barns, the, the barns. And the there. old horse barn was there. Yes. Okay. And that used to be, that was a treat. Easter vacation, was the kids would get together and visit the ag campus. That was, a, and of course, buttermilk, it was part of the. Oh, sure. <laughs> 
<laughs> we used to get free buttermilk. Yes, right. until it finally got to be a little expensive. And, uh, I think then they, st they moved to charging for a paper cup. Yes. Mm -hmm. The milk was free, but the cup cost. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. <laughs> they, have, they have cut down on the uh, attendance. Right. So, a little bit, I think. Oh, yeah. well, one thing I remember, uh, Professor Prokosch was a teacher of German, and he used to ride down states. Uh, Frank Lloyd Wright. Do you have any memories of him, Patty? Yes, because when I was at the school, now this was in 1902, when I was at school, the Hillside uh, Home mm -hmm. School, and I was seven years old, and Frank Lloyd Wright was uh, getting ready to build the school. Um, not Tallyus and West, it was, no. it was called Hillside Home School, but he was building a large school building, and I remember that. And um, it was a little more expensive than they expected, and uh, Later, Aunt Nellie and Aunt Jenny Lloyd-Jones went bankrupt, you know. And I can remember uh, they're saying that renegade nephew. And I learned the word nef uh, renegade, and I thought, what a wonderful word. I didn't know what it meant, but I felt it wasn't too complimentary at any rate. Uh, but that was one of the first big words I ever learned, renegade. And where were your classes? If they were building. I, I, I was the only child of that age of seven. Uh, the next oldest was 12, so I was just a little tag along out was there. Was there a one room school? Were you in no. a big house? Or? No, yes, they had a large house, a residence house, and that's where I lived, and most of the uh, pupils lived there. And then there were a couple of smaller buildings, uh, home cottage, one was called, and another little cottage, where there were classes. Oh. And there was a piano, and I remember I took piano lessons in one of the classes. But I just met as an individual with teachers, you know. Yes. And uh, I don't know how I ever learned anything, but I apparently did. And um, then they were building this school, the, uh, the exactly. home school. Mm -hmm. And uh, there was a big library at one end, and that later uh, burned and had to be rebuilt. But there were some little, uh, little rooms along a corridor. And... Uh, they were little classrooms and little kitchens and uh, a theater at one end. And the theater had a, a very low door so that you would have to, do, even a, a person of ordinary size, six feet, would have to squat to oh. get through that door. And um, uh, Thanksgiving came along and I was a, a little pilgrim child in one of the plays. All I had to do was stand there and uh, do nothing. <laughs> Did, did you ever see Frank Lloyd Wright? Oh, I must have seen him, but he, he didn't make very much of an impression on me at that time because, of course, his name and then didn't mean anything, especially to a seven-year-old. Right. Except that, uh, uh, and I probably was keeping out of the way of that renegade. Anyway. Later years, did you ever see him as he would drive in Madison? Oh, I used to see him around Madison, of course. Well, describe him. How would he? How would he appear? Well, uh, slightly flamboyant, I think. But he had an open car with a chauffeur, yes. and he'd sit in the back seat with his, with his flowing, bo well, flowing bow tie and a uh, fancy hat of some kind, you know. He has the wind. He he was important, but uh, except with the bankers, and the bankers didn't like him very well. And did you know Bob Ackley? Yes. Uh -huh. Well, uh, Bob Ackley used to have some dealings with him. Bob Ackley was a uh, uh, brother-in-law, I guess you call him. Was Bob Ackley related to Wright? No. Oh. No, he was a banker, yeah. but uh, he he married Mel's sister, so that's oh, how I knew him. Oh, she was related to him. Oh, yes. I see. Oh, yeah, I remember now. Yes, and... Uh, I remember, he, sure. And uh, so he was... Well, Frank Wright Wright designed this hotel in, in Tokyo that withstood the earthquake. Yes. And when he was over there, didn't he buy a lot of Japanese prints? Oh, yes. And, and, uh, and then he borrowed money at the bank and put the prints up as security. Then, he went in there, then they foreclosed, and he lost the, the prints. And didn't the Van Vlucks get that? And then they later gave them to the library. And then Hasbrook inherited them. Mm -hmm. And then when Hasbrook died, he gave them the university library. And that's how they happened to get these prints, isn't it? Oh, are they now at the LVM? 
Now, now it's the album, yeah. that's right. That's what I thought. Well, it's a very fine collection. Yeah. Yeah. The Van Blecks, um, he was a professor of, of um, mathematics. Here. He must have been on the faculty when you came. You know, well, he was, and my mother and father had just built their house, and the Van Blecks were a young couple. They didn't have a place to stay, so they stayed in our house for a while. This was before I had arrived on the scene. Oh, yeah. So they stayed there for a while with us. And Hasbrook and I used to play as children together. Oh, all right. Is that right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, the Van Blecks later lived up on uh, Pinckney Street. Mm -hmm. Pinckney Street. And Hasbrook, of course, has had quite a career. One of his favorites was uh, uh, railroad statistics. Oh. <laughs> when you were young, we had two newspapers. The State Journal was still here in the Madison and Democrat. The Democrat, yes. Democrat was a morning paper. Yes. Okay. There was another one that uh, my father used to get, Inter Ocean. I, I think that, that was I think that was a Chicago paper, and I'm not sure whether that was the forerunner of the Tribune or not, but it was um, called Inter Ocean, and uh, my father used to take that. You know Dick Marshall, of course. Sure. We were classmates. And you know Higgy Ban Brandenburg? Oh, yes. <laughs> he was a SIU, and I used to see him when Dick, he came to the SIU. Dick oh. used to tell about one time the Brandenburgs were, the marshals were entertaining the Brandenburgs, and after dinner, they went up, Higgy went up and talked to the Dick's kid and was uh, had a drink or so, and they got talking about the Capitol fire. And, Dick, and Hagee said, I'm the guy that started the fire. Oh, <laughs> oh dear. <laughs> and of course, the next morning, six kids were at school telling them that they had met the fellow who started the Capitol oh. fire. <laughs> Dick always used to get a big kick out of that. Uh, did Hagee have to live that down? Yeah. <laughs> I remember there was a, a Mr. Crampton who was a neighbor of ours. Uh, the son was in the Sumner and Crampton drugstore later. And they lived near us. And Mr. Crampton was a night watchman at the Capitol. And he discovered this fire. And uh, he couldn't put it out. It was uh, just gotten too far. And it was a, a gas, a gas light. Oh. Yeah. Too, too much fire. Yeah. Not too high. It started. <laughs> and in those days, they used to have the Palace of Sweets. Oh. <laughs> where was that? <laughs> where was that? What was it and where was it? That was at the head of State Street, and it was on the, as you went up State Street toward the Capitol, it was on the left-hand side, and it was uh, very fancy, and it opened up on State Street, and you could also get into it from uh, Carroll Street on the back, mm. and it was filled with places to sit down and have ice cream sodas and things like that. <laughs> that reminds me of a And you remember tale. Walsingers? And Walsingers were around on... Uh, what was that? That was a... a, a a, uh, ice cream and uh, like the Palace of Sweets, oh. an ice cream and candy shop. And uh, Fr uh, Fritz Waltzinger was uh, in school with me. He was a son of Alfred. And that was uh, along about where Simpson's uh, store used to be. Um, well, it's near the YWCA. Yes, right, uh, oh. near the YW on um, North Pinckney Street. And uh, well, those are the two ca candy shops. That, that was before the candy shop developed on uh, uh, State Street. The chocolate shop. Chocolate shop. Yeah, shops, yeah, I remember that one. Mm -hmm. and, uh, before that one developed, there was another one. Al Schwegler had a candy shop in the 400 block on State Street, uh, on the south side as you go up State Street, and then that later developed into the chocolate shop. Mr. Daniel had the chocolate. You still had the chocolate shop for ice cream Sundays. Uh, and lunches. It was very nice. And uh, when you walked in, um, um, well, up a few steps, on street level were the candies uh, on the display on either side. Then you went up, up a few steps, and uh, then there were the booths where you could get mm -hmm. the, the food. Mr. Daniel conducted that place until after the end of War One, and he signed off because he realized that uh, he couldn't and wouldn't serve liquor, and there was no parking anymore. So he just moved out to, he went out to Tucson. Mm -hmm. went out there. But he came back. He died when he was here in Madison. Mr. Daniel yeah. died, what, a couple of years ago? Within the last two years. Well, yes, but he had been living out west. I guess he came back. I didn't realize that he had, uh, 
But next okay. to the chocolate shop was what? Pantorium. The pan well, and also there was another place. Morgan's, remember Dad? Oh, Morgan's? of course, Dad Morgan's Malden Mill. Oh, mercy, yes. Well, that, that's history. Well, uh, those were the best malted milks you could get anywhere, weren't they? Wonderful. And, of course, women never went in there. Oh, really? Well, women didn't go in. To, uh, it, was a, it, was a, it was a man's retreat, and if, if you went in there, you snuck in. And um, <laughs> three of us were going to have a, a picnic, ride our bicycles out around uh, uh, the lake near the campsite, and have breakfast, and we were going to take malted milk. So I was going to get the malted milk. So I called up to order them because I knew I couldn't go in there. And I said, now we'll come at such and such a time and come to the door and get them. <laughs> I think I sit, just stepped inside the door and I felt as though I were stepping into a dreadful place. Oh, my. <laughs> anyway, I, got, I got the malted milk and got yeah. them safely home. And you remember when they built the gay building, our first skyscraper? Oh, down on the square. Well, I don't particularly re recall that. But that was the first building of more than several couple of stories here in Madison, wasn't it? Uh, uh, certainly the first one around the square of, of any notice. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Can't, can't remember that. I remember the, the, when the Tenney building was built, there was quite a discussion about the, the marble in the lobby. There was something wrong with the marble in the lobby. I don't know what it was. But something happened. And uh, teachers and lawyers and doctors were on a plane by themselves and could do no wrong. They were they were eminent people, all to be respected. Have you changed your mind about lawyers? <laughs> no, not, uh, about some, yes. Uh, okay. <laughs> and about some ministers too. Anyway, they were all on the high high plane and always behaved in an exemplary manner, and uh -huh. so forth and so on. And I was a sophomore in the university, and I was in a French conversation class, and it was a small class, and this man who was teaching was kind of a funny guy, I decided. And um, anyway, he was giving a dissertation about his family affairs one day, and he said, I won't have to be teaching all my life. My mother is well off, and when she dies, I will get what she has, and I won't have to teach anymore. Well, you know, if somebody had stood up there and shot me, I wouldn't have been more shocked or surprised because all of a sudden my idea of a teacher's perfection just went right through the floor. He had no calling. No. <laughs> we had university faculty at, uni at the university high school. Yeah. yeah. They, were there. they were all members of the university faculty. Okay. And I, I think they were excellent teachers. Oh, they they were, and it, it was a, it was a wonderful thing for the the kids over there. Yes, right. and uh, it, it was, was it was 30s, called the, yeah. it was called the fool's retreat for no reason at all, except that it grew up out of uh, Miss Richmond's academy. That's right. And Miss Richmond had an academy on oh. on State Street, and it was over uh, what is now I guess it's the bank building and, and uh, Wehrman's and uh, the corner of State and uh, Gilman oh, yeah. upstairs, Miss Richmond's academy. And presumably, the students who couldn't make it in high school or had a special privilege of some kind went to Miss Richmond's Academy, and it was called the Fool's Retreat. And then when the, the University High School uh, started, uh, that seemed to absorb Richmond's Academy, and it also very shortly absorbed this name of Fool's Retreat. But that didn't last very long because it was anything, because some of the smartest students were coming out of the University High School. Daddy, did you ever know Ruby Corscott? Yeah. Probably not. Yes, uh, that name. She, yes. Her father, I think it was her father, who was Evan Peck. Either her father or her grand, no, I guess her grandfather. When the Pecks, the Pecks were the first white settlers here. Yes. And when they came, they had a small child. And I think that child was either Ruby's father or grandfather. And I have heard her talk about that, so that I was always amazed that here, uh, uh, running between two or possibly three generations, was the first white settler here coming to Madison and Ruby Corscott.
I wish I could remember the generations in there, but it always amazed me that they were so close. That, and all in that short period, Madison yeah. developed. And so yeah. that's yeah. right. That's right. And I remember her telling me there's there's supposed to be one spot on King Street, which is the first Peck home. Yes. But Ruby Korsgut said that isn't the right place. It's somewhat it's one some way or the other, other from where it was. Yeah, I think they still argue about that. I think they still argue. That's right. Yeah. That's been disputed as it has every, every yeah. once in a while. Well, there used to be a um, a horse barn on State Street, and one up on um, what East Washington Avenue just off the square, mm -hmm. and uh, that's where ho horses were stabled, and if you wanted to rent a horse, that's where you'd find one. And um, Marjorie Doty, whose ancestors were the Doty people around here, had a ho horse, and uh, she and I used to ride once in a while. I would go and rent a horse, and we would ride r all around town, around the square and everything on these uh, horses, great. you know. <laughs> and um, one night we were just about ready to go home, I guess, and... Um, I've forgotten whether her horse kicked mine or my horse kicked hers. But at any rate, there was a little disagreement between the horses, and off they both started for the barn, and they tore right through the Capitol Square, not on the uh, walks, you know, but right through the grounds and digging nice holes in that side, right up to the barn. Well, luckily they went that way and not out to the country. Yes. <laughs> Daddy, when you were in school in Spring Green, the only way you'd get there is by train, wasn't it? Yes. From Madison to Spring yes. Green. Mm -hmm. And that's the way we do it. I remember when, when Christmas time came, uh, one of the teachers was coming back to Madison. So she brought me back home, that and my good. father met the train here. And they had a, a, a carry-all. Carry and we used to ride in that the three miles from the school to uh, Spring Green. And that was very exciting. When we did. Oh. And uh, another... Uh, a few years later, when I must have been about 10 or 12, my mother was stronger, and we went out there and spent a couple of, uh, oh, a summer, maybe a month or so in the summer. We did that for a couple of summers. And then I used to ride horseback around out there. And um, I was uh, way out, on, on the way past the little church, and here was this cloud of, of uh, dust coming up the road. And uh, it was a car. The uh, uh, Johnson, the Johnsons, Carl Johnson and uh, Miss, Mrs. Johnson and Mrs. Jacobs were out there in their touring car. They had a chauffeur and with their bales floating, you know, and it was raising all this stuff. And my pony just started up and ran as fast as it could back to the stable and saw that dust. <laughs> and I remember holding onto the reins with one hand and the... Um, Maine. Maine with the other end, and we went right into the stable, right into its stall. <laughs> <laughs> that was the wildest ride I ever had. I bet it was. <laughs> what year was it you got your first car? Uh, when, okay. when did you buy your first car, Patty? 1925, and it was a um, 1923 Dodge Coupe, and I was playing golf that summer, and I had to have some way of getting out. Mother and I were living at the L Lorraine Hotel, then we'd just come back from uh, being out on the West Coast for a while. And um, uh, I bought this Dodge Coupe, and it cost $600. And uh, I borrowed some money from the bank to, to buy that car. <laughs> you probably didn't have insurance. In those days, you wouldn't have liability insurance, or did you get some insurance? I had some kind of insurance, yes. I know I, I, I knew I should have something like that. And uh, I remember learning to drive um, of uh, Mr. Batchelor. He was a professor of uh, English at the university. And um, he taught me to drive. And we went out in uh, what was then Lake Forest, you know. Oh, yes. Lost, Lost City. And there weren't any houses. And it was a wonderful place to learn to drive because here were all these little roads with turns and things and no traffic. And uh, oh, he had, uh, one thing he had me do he had two rulers, and he laid them down at right angles to the edge of the road, and he said, now you back into that. Mm -hmm. So he made me back in between those two rulers, learn how to back into that. You didn't have to have a driver's license then, did you? Oh, there, I don't think there were any such things. I no. don't think so. No. No, I can't remember. And um, I, I, I learned to drive all right, and I remember 
the first time I drove into a, a place where there was a city, and I said, oh, we're coming to a town. What do I do? <laughs> yeah, what do I, I do? <laughs> but after I got through that, it was all right. Well, good. And in the original cars, they didn't have horns. They had, uh, you'd have to... Uh, it's a bulb. Had a bulb beyond yeah. which you pressed. I, I can't remember about that one. I think I think it had a... a Maybe uh, by that time it, it had, probably did. It had something else. But, uh, but it didn't have automatic windshield wipers. You had to reach up and do your own oh. wiping, you know. And, of course, uh, uh, no heater. Oh. So you, you didn't and gear shift. I put the, it up in the winter. You had the gear shift. Yes, you had a gear shift. And, and uh, the Dodge was the, just opposite from the others. The uh, others were... Uh, Back, back to the left and the front. Mm -hmm. Anyway, the Dodge was just opposite all the, the other cars. <laughs> that was terrible. Yeah. No, in the old days they didn't have electric lights, on the headlights on the car. You'd have to stop and and start a little uh, settling or something. You'd get out of your car and set no, something oh, which would turn the lights uh, on. Mine, ha mine had electric. Well, mine had electric, electric lights. Yes, on. but then there was a while of when. Oh, when we were living up at Candy Manor, when we parked it out on the street at night, and then you, you had to have a light, and I thought I can't let my lights run all night, so I bought a, a couple of kerosene lamps and oh. hung out on there. <laughs> so I had to have a can of kerosene and so run the lamps. Well, that didn't last very long, and I guess I kept it in the garage at uh, uh, <laughs> Candy Manor by that time. Right. How long did you keep the car? 1925. I didn't have to have very much done with it. Oh, one time uh, I was right near the two. I was going by there and uh, I heard a clunk and uh, something fell out. Mm -hmm. I thought, oh, mercy, what's going to happen? Well, I was right near the garage where I'd bought it, the Madison Motor Car Company. So I went in there and they came out and fixed it. There wasn't anything to it, apparently. Oh. Just something that loose. So I had no trouble with that. And I think it was um, then Mother and I. Uh, took a trip. We went out west again for a while. And when I came back, I bought a Victory 6. And that was a a, um, a General Motors car. Uh -huh. I think it was a Dodge. No, that was a Dodge. And um, I didn't like it too well. And I got another one later. Did you ever have a flat tire? Oh, <laughs> oh those were terrible. Oh, there. did you? <laughs> yeah, that's what. <laughs> well, uh, Mother and I had the experience. We were, my aunt was up in the hospital at Rochester, Minnesota, and Mother and I thought we'd go up to see her. And so I started out in, uh, I think this was the Victory 6, too. We got out to an arena, and uh, I had a fat tire. All right, we got that fixed. And then we got along our right, got up to Rochester, and we were coming back, and we were in Minnesota, just the other side of Wisconsin, and I had another fat tire. It was getting along late in the afternoon, and it was right in front of a farmhouse. And, um, oh, I'd had a flat tire. That was it. So I had, so my, I didn't have a spare then. Oh. And, and right in front of the farmhouse, I had another flat tire. I thought, oh, dear. And I went in. It was milking time, and these two men were milking their cows. And this one man stopped. I think he was kind of glad to be relieved of his job because he seemed glad to take over. And um, uh, he got his car out and he took the tires and me and into Ooh, town oh, to nice. see a um, little town. Anyway, we got the tires fixed. And um, when we got back, I said, uh, uh, how much do I owe you? He would not take a cent. I couldn't even throw money at him. <laughs> he just wouldn't take a cent. Yeah. He was just being very nice. So I decided he probably was glad to be relieved of the... Yes, yeah, got out of the milking. <laughs> And anyway, when I got home, the next day I went to the tire place and I got four, four ply tires. <laughs> no one. You learned that lesson. But <laughs> yeah. well, a four ply tire is not the easiest thing to ride on, but it was much better sure. insurance sure. for puncture. The roads weren't as good those days as they are now. Mm. Oh no, and it would just be a joy when you get on a good macadam road that didn't have too many loose pebbles on it. Well, we used to ride around up in the northern part of the state. And I had my mother with me. She was a very strong person, and uh, so I didn't dare get her out somewhere. <laughs> I know my father spoke of corduroy roads up in the north. 
Oh, I never, I never saw those, but I they, think they, they probably were. Logs. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And then you went. <laughs> yeah. The advantage was there was supposed to, uh, they were supposed to drain off or something. Yes, it wasn't a great advantage. Just to play when we were kids. Hide and go seek and run my good sheep run. Do you remember those sure. games? Sure. sure. <coughs> we played something called Red Rover. Red Rover. Did you do make things in the snow? Oh. We used to make angels. Big snowmen, sure. Oh, big, big snowmen. snowmen, of course. Yeah. That, that was fun. Yeah. I think the mo- most exciting was the one I mentioned about the um, uh, hooking the, the uh, big bobs going out on the ice. Now, were you on foot or were you with a sled? Oh, no, you'd, you'd just jump on these big runners. They were they were big, thick runners, you yes. know. And uh, then it was all right to go out, but they didn't like to have you come back. Didn't you used to slide on the Pinckney Street Hill with sleds? Mm-hmm. Yes, and more on Wisconsin Avenue. Oh, that's For a good some street. reason or other. On Wisconsin Avenue, you could go down to... Um, Johnson? Gorham, Gorham Street or Johnson Street, and um, uh, then you'd have to walk back up the hill, of course, if you didn't mind. But in those days, there were no cars to worry about. Didn't have to, didn't have that concern. No. Another place where you used to slide was um, down back of uh, Bascom Hill. Oh. Oh yeah. That that was the that was pretty good. Mm-hmm. And we used to slide down Prospect Avenue and then make the corner and go down Spooner or Princeton. And that was a pretty good hill Across too. Across University it? Avenue. Uh-huh. And we're not supposed to cross the That's railroad right. tracks, but no. sometimes we do that you do it, if dangerously. The, if the ice was just right, you could do it. Yeah. yeah. Uh-huh. Well, you have you done that then? I don't. I don't know that I ever did it on Prospect Avenue. No. But you mentioned uh, living out there. Did you know the Knowlton family? Oh sure. I used to play with the with the Knowlton kids there. Gertrude. Gertrude and Margaret. Margaret. And Helen was there a third. Mar- there were Margaret and Helen. Okay. You probably used to play with the Buell girls. There was Helen, Pauline, Martha, and one more. Pauline, and these three. Martha, Pauline, and um, Helen was my age. Martha was younger. She Martha married, was the youngest. She married Louis Slichter. Mm. Martha. Married a Slichter, yes. Yes, yeah. and um, Martha and oh, I... I, I I can't think of the old, I can think of Pauline, but I can't think of the older one's name now. Gertrude, um, Gertrude Wilson is still alive. Yes. yes. Mm-hmm. She's over on Regent Street. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Well, her daughter Jill comes here That's and right. helps somebody out. Yeah, and Mrs. Wilson has written some essays mm-hmm. about the Heights. That's right. That's in the right. early days. Mm-hmm. Well, she could tell you a lot, lot about the Heights. Right. And the, the Mowers live right next door to them. He was head of the uh, mechanics, the oh. mechanics department. No, he was not next door to the Wilsons. The, oh, the Knowltons. No, he was not next door to the Knowltons. The Knowltons lived on Kendall. Yes. And, and the Mars lived on Prospect Avenue. Well, at, our, at one time... About a block away. Their, yeah. At one time, their house was right next door. And then the next house was Ely. Ely house yeah. was in between. <laughs> oh, that yeah. Well, I'm sure that the Mar- I thought the Mars are right next door to the uh, Knowltons. Mm-hmm. Roland Maurer and Jean Maurer were the children. Mm-hmm. Now the Tenors lived up above us. Yes. And the Gilmore House was that Frank Lloyd Wright House. Oh, yes. Now a landmark. Mm-hmm. And the Buell House, all up on University Heights. Yeah, well, that's yeah. going the other way. That's going the other way, that's mm-hmm. right. And the Bradley House, which which is now the Sig, now the Sigma Phi House, mm-hmm. you know where that is. Yes. Right? Okay. Well, that was right near where you lived there. Well, we Not lived on Prospect from... later years, but originally it was Arlington Place, which was just below the Tenor House, where we lived. Those hills must have been good for sledding. <laughs> it was a beautiful. Yeah. They didn't clean the streets in those days. Mm-hmm. In those days, there used to be a watering truck.